Okay, maybe we should start. So, uh, if anyone join us, that's also fine. Uh, so, it's nice to see you again for the third time uh, today as you were informed at the very beginning. Uh, we will deal with the constitutional interpretation and in that respect I'm really glad uh, to announce the following two uh, speakers uh, in our course. First is our dear colleague and friend, uh, he's a permanent visiting professor at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, uh, Ken Aina Kimna. Uh, he's coming from the uh, United States, from Seattle, uh, and he's one of the uh, leading legal philosophers, but also uh, a scholar who has written uh, quite a number of pieces that deal with the topic of uh, constitution, constitutional interpretation and constitutionalism generally. And that's the reason why uh, we invited him to present you this more kind of a uh, general story of the different theories of constitutional interpretation. Uh, after his presentation, you will have the chance to uh, meet one of the uh, newly appointed uh, judges of the Constitutional Court of Serbia, and I dare to speak also, dare to say, my uh, dear colleague and friend, uh, Tamas Korhec, uh, who will uh, provide an insight into the uh, constitutional interpretation and reasoning from the perspective of a constitutional judge. So, as in all other uh, workshops of ours, you will get bo both theoretical and more practical side of the story. And since we are a little bit late, I don't want to uh, take more of Ken's time. So Ken, the floor is yours, please. Um, thank you. Uh, it's a, you know, drive, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I try to come to Belgrade uh, twice a year to do lectures and, and little classes like this. Uh, it's one of the greatest cities in the world, and a whole lot of my very clo closest friends I have actually um, are in Belgrade, including Mia Drag, although you would not know that we're close friends from the fact that he mispronounces my name chronically, but I'll, I'll look past that. Okay, the, the top, oh, one more thing. I, I would invite you to ask questions and make comments as we go along. If, you, if there's something I don't, I say that you don't understand, you should feel free to stop me and ask me for clarification. Um, because I frequently, I tend frequently to, um, I, I tend to be unclear more often than I'd like to admit to myself. So if you have a comment or objection to something I say, and we'll be dealing with arguments, um, so you're welcome to challenge me on anything I, I have to say. I'm not lecturing at you. We're going to go through arguments together. I have views. You have views. My views, I'll express my views, but they're contestable and you're welcome to contest them. Um, in fact, it'll be much more fun to me for me if we actually engage. Um, so please feel free to challenge me at any time. Okay. Um, well, what is interpretation? Interpretation is the process of extracting a certain kind of propositional content from linguistic symbols that are intended to express that content. Now, I'm using, I'm deliberately using very general language here. I'm not talking about words and meanings because interpretation, one can interpret words to extract meanings, but interpretation, the notion of interpretation is broader than that. It's all about extracting some kind of content, propositional, it actually doesn't have to be propositional content. In the case of interpreting a word, you're not getting a prop, you're not getting propositional content, you're getting the meaning of a word. For example, if I'm interpreting the word bachelor, the content of the word would be unmarried man, and that's not a proposition. Um, but the notion of interpretation is much broader than extracting uh, meanings from sentences. Um, if you try to, to, to decode, uh, decode a piece of 
of, uh, I guess the word would be code, you're actually engaged in a process of interpretation, right? Somebody tries to encode or encrypt a particular piece of information so that you can't figure it out. The encryption is just another form of language that can be interpreted by decoding it, by de 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 decrypting it, I guess. So not everything counts as an interpretation. I mean, we're trying to extract content from linguistic symbols. Interpretation is the kind of thing that has to take place in a principled way. I mean, you could randomly, you could randomly um, try to extract content from, from the symbols, but that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be interpretation. So in order to interpret, right, you have to extract content according to certain principles. For example, if I'm interpreting, if I'm interpreting uh, a word, right, I'll go to the dictionary, a word I don't know, I'll go to the dictionary and consult it for the lexical meaning, and that is, a, for me, a process of interpretation until I learn the word. The notion of interpretation is extremely broad. So the content can be a meaning in the literal sense, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if you're reading a novel, there are all kinds of meanings that you can get out of the, the novel. The, the one one layer of meaning would be concerned with just figuring out what each sentence means so that you can put together the story that the, the, the series of sentences conveys. Just the story, the events that it depicts. And then there's another layer of meaning, the so-called message that the author might be intending, intending to convey. That's also a form of in, interpretation, trying to extract that content from the set of symbols, the story that the author writes, is also a process of interpretation, but it's not about really extracting meaning in the literal sense of the word. Um, I'm going to try to control myself from not going on a tangent. Um, the kind of thing I do is think about concepts. And what I find interesting, I don't, you know, I don't think a whole lot, um, contrary to what uh, Meadrog said, I, don't, I, I haven't thought a whole lot about the notion of interpretation. But in thinking about it today, while I was prepping this, it occurs to me that there are a variety, that really, all of these things that we call interpretation are so different, they're radically different from one another in, in certain respects. Um, they don't really constitute a unified phenomenon, which would, make it, which would make it very difficult to give an explanation of the notion of interpretation. I mean, we're using the word interpretation meaning to designate very different phenomena that are related to each other solely in virtue of the fact that we're extracting some kind of content from some kind of linguistic symbols. But in the case, when it comes to things like novels and such, um, there are different layers of interpretation. There's different kinds of interpretation, so different that the only thing that you can say that they have in common is we're extracting content from symbols and that's it. Um, legal interpretation is the prospect of extracting legal content from the words used to express that content. And here the guiding principles are, they're legal principles. Right? Legal principles govern legal interpretation. Um, not semantic rules, not ordinary definitions. It's up to the courts, it's up to the legal system to decide how you are to extract or how you can authoritatively extract content from a string of linguistic symbols in the form of a text. So you have, and just a quick observation here, I can't speak for the, the legal system in Serbia, but in the United States, different principles um, of legal interpretation apply to different kinds of texts. The principles of interpretation that apply to constitutional texts don't apply to statutes. Statutes have to be, especially criminal statutes, criminal statutes have to be construed almost in accordance with the plain meaning, the dictionary meanings of the terms, um, and you don't do that with a constitution. You can't do that with a constitution. Right, the Constitution, uh, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says um, Congress shall not, make, not uh, make any laws abridging free speech. Well, if you try to interpret that on the basis of dictionary definitions, you're not going to get very far. What does speech mean? If you look in a dictionary, the answer it gives, gives you is not going to be terribly helpful. Um, why do we do it in the case of criminal statutes? Well, and this gestures in the direction of, of a very important fact about legal interpretation. It is a matter of utmost moral importance. When it comes to criminal statutes, right, what, the, what is behind the rule, in this, the rule in the United States that criminal statutes have to be expressed 
in um, plain, in very plain words, and they're going to be construed very strictly in accordance with the, the plain meanings of the terms, is this. Your, the interests, your interests that are implicated in a criminal matter are very important. You can have your freedom deprived. You can be incarcerated. Um, and for that reason, the thought is that there's a moral obligation on the part of the state to make it as clear as possible that a particular behavior is legally wrong, legally problematic, and will subject you to forcible incarceration. Now, those same interests aren't at stake in the case of, say, torts, right? Tort, when you're, when you are, um, in the United States, when you're interpreting uh, the language of tort, you have, the courts have much more leeway to interpret, um, to interpret and construct the terms because, look, all we're doing, and this is important as a moral matter, we're moving money around. Right. Um, if, if I'm dealing with a, a breach of contract or a tort, uh, and I I hold you're a point, you're a defendant, and I as a judge hold you liable. Look, you have a moral interest at stake, right? Because I'm about to to make you move your property to someone else in order to compensate them for damages. But the moral interest that you have at stake is far less important than the moral interest that you have at stake when it comes to criminal statutes. You're not talking about going to jail. You're not talking about having your reputation ruled. You're not talking about a, a criminal record following you around for the rest of your life and, in, and inhibiting the opportunities, restricting the opportunities that you have to do certain kinds of things, right? It's just a one-time payment and it's all over. So different texts, right? Different texts are going to be interpreted. If the law is working properly and the people who are in charge, so to speak, of the legal system are doing their job properly, the courts will articulate, or if, it's, if interpretation is a matter that's handled by statute, different principles of interpretation to handle, to apply to different kinds of, of norms, whether constitutional, criminal, or, or, uh, what's the, or the common law because this is a matter of great importance. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, a con about constitutions. What do constitutions do? Well, constitutions do two things. Well, actually it does one thing. A constitution sets up a legal system. You, are, you might have a written constitution, constitution, you might have an unwritten constitution, but a constitution sets up, it creates the legal game, right? <coughs> There was no unified government in the United States before there was a written constitution. Then the states ratified it, they agreed to a contract, and that brought the federal legal system into existence. That's what constitutions do. Sometimes they're written and sometimes they're written and they're explicit, sometimes not. You can have unwritten constitutions that are presupposed, but that's probably not the best way to go about it as far as I'm concerned. So there are two things that a constitution will do in order to set up a government. The first is procedural. Constitutions lay out the rules for making, changing, and adjudicating law. So they, they, they set out the procedures for, for doing this, including the procedures for selecting the people who are going to do the legislating and adjudicating. Um, the second thing they do, one hopes, is they they define substantive limits on what the lawmaking powers and adjudicative powers can do. The US Constitution affords um, a right to free speech. It's, it sets up, the procedural part of the Constitution sets up a democracy, a representative democracy, but the substantive provisions, the amendments, create rights that, that have the effect of defining substantive limits on what a democratic majority can do. And that's a good thing, because I'm from America, and right now I am not trusting what Democratic majorities are doing in America. In fact, I, you know, you may have a different politics from me, but I'll tell you, the events of the last two years have, uh, have completely shaken my faith in democracy to the foundation. Um, but that's, that's me. In any event, for that reason, you want these substantive limits to protect, from, protect against the so-called tyranny of the majority. Now, both of these functions have tremendous moral importance. It matters a lot to all of us, morally and prudentially, in terms of what our self-interests are, whether the system of governance is democratic, um, whether you have substantive rights, 
you know, it matters whether it's democratic or uh, as opposed to authoritarian, whether there are substantive limits on what the government can do or the government is totalitarian. That is a matter of tremendous moral importance. These are choices that we as a people have to make, although they are frequently left to the, the courts to do, except, well, in the case of constitution drafters, founders. Okay, so interpreting constitution. You know, I was going to say a little something about the relationship between legal reasoning and legal interpretation. They're not the same thing. Um, you can reason without interpreting. I mean, I, I don't know what this says about my business, but I do that all the time. I reason without interpreting. You might even be able to interpret without reasoning. I'm not sure that I'm reasoning when somebody says to me the sun is shining or it's hot in the room. I'm not, I'm not sure there's any reasoning involved. So the relationship between legal reasoning and legal interpretation, or reasoning and interpretation, they're related, but they're, they're distinct as well. Um, the thing about constitutions, the most conspicuous feature um, of constitutions when it comes to interpretive difficulties is that they're expressed in very general, highly abstract language that has to be interpreted. Um, for example, uh, for purposes of the First Amendment, what counts as speech? Certainly political speech. Um, does, do certain forms of artistic speech or exp artistic expression count as speech? Dance, does dance sound as count as speech? Abstract painting, does that count as speech? Does pornography count as speech? In the United States, all three of those things are protected speech. Um, okay, what determines how judges must interpret a constitution? The law, the law. And as I, there are many options for interpreting a constitution, as you'll see, turns out there are, there are a fair number of theories of constitutional interpretations. Different judges in the Supreme Court, on the Supreme Court in the United States, subscribe to different theories or principles of constitutional interpretation. Again, right, the point here is that the choice, whatever the choice, whatever the choice that a judge makes, or a choice that the society makes, it should be grounded in moral considerations. I mean, look, there's a deeper problem here that has, one has to always be aware of when he's theorizing about courts in the law, at least theorizing about what courts in, courts in the law should do. And here's the problem. Legal... Can I help, man? Resurrection of Soviet Union. Huh? Is it? We set up for, for you this one. They said you can just shut the Legal systems do something that nobody else gets to do. Anybody have a clue? Nobody else gets to do what legal systems get to do. Legal systems tell you what to do behind the threat of force. Nobody else gets to tell you what to do, tell you, look, you're going to do this or a bad thing is going to happen. Legal systems are a little bit like armed robbers. Right, here's what an armed robber does. Armed robber comes up to you, points a gun at you, and says, give me your money or else. Now, law isn't as vulgar as that, um, not, uh, not usually, but that's exactly what the law is going to do. The law tells you, you will not take something that doesn't belong to you without, without permission, or you will go to jail. So what gives the state the right to do something like that? What gives anybody the right to, I mean, it's one thing to try to tell me what to do or suggest that I do something. It's another thing to tell me what to do and back it up with a threat of some kind of unpleasant sanction. This is the most fundamental problem in political theory. This is what political, normative political theory, normative meaning um, evaluated, telling, uh, it says something about what the world should be. This is the foundational problem of political theory, the foundational problem of political philosophy, and it's the, it should be the foundational problem behind every legal practice. Every legal practice should seek to be morally legitimate, morally justified. So that's why, when it comes to legal interpretation, we always have to keep in mind that people are pointing guns at you, potentially. I don't know if you, any of you have any experience with this. I certainly don't. But the police don't come to your door and knock on your door and say, please, would you mind coming with us, right? They point guns and put handcuffs on you. But none of you would have any experience with, with any of that, of course. 
Um, okay, constitutional interpretation. Excuse me, I need to get some water. There, there are two types of constitution. I feel like I should salute. No, no, my family is of a, I'm, a, I'm the first American born. My family is from Estonia and they, they fled um, Estonia when the Soviets the next country. So if this is really, is this really the, a Soviet anthem? There is a picture there. Huh? A uh, picture there is there. A picture there is called a picture. And is, is the Soviet Union? Uh, or, or would you? This, uh, this is a traditional Russian song. Oh, okay. I don't, okay, I don't, I, mean, I don't care one way or the other. I don't have anything to stake in this. In this. Um, so, two types of constitution, theory of constitutional interpretation. The first theory is what's called a fixed, fixed content theory. This is extremely distracting. Um, according to fixed content theories, the only theory of interpretation that is morally justified, right? And again, moral justification is always behind all of this, is one that assigns fixed content to the Constitution. And by fixed content, I mean this. When, you, when the Constitution is interpreted, it is interpreted that way forever. The Constitution, the content of the Constitution is fixed. It can't change. Judges can't change the Constitution. I suppose legislators can by ratify, ratifying amendments, but the content, according to, to this theory, the only the, the only principles of constitutional interpretation that are morally justified are those that fix the content forever such that the content is absolute and unchanging. The second kind of uh, theory of constitutional interpretation is a living tree um, theory. According to living tree theories, the content of the Constitution can, and you know what, it, content of anything can change because the content, you get the content out of the text and how, what content you get out of the text is up to you and how you interpret it. Um, according to living tree theories of constitutional interpretation, the content of the Constitution can, well that's, that's, that's trivial, that's obvious, and should change to reflect changing moral views on the part of citizens. And if you just start thinking about this right away, um, well, that's all right, don't start thinking about it right away. I don't want to think about it right away either. The first fixed content theory is called originalism. Originalism is the principle, um, is the view that the principles of the Constitution ought to be interpreted in accordance with what's called the original understanding of those principles. That is, in accordance with one, the understanding that somebody, okay, so we're talking about somebody else's understanding. Two, that ordinary people had of the principle. Three, at the time it was ratified. So an original says, look, you want to figure out what the Constitution means? Figure out what it means to the people at the time the relevant provision was ratified. Now, original understanding is not framers' intent. Um, you know, some people, uh, some people like to say that the Constitution should be interpreted in accordance with the framers' intent. You know, I mean, there are lots of problems with this. Um, but one of, the, one of the problems is the framers are a group of people, and there's no such, I mean, it's hard to figure out what a collective intention is. And two, it would be hard to figure out I mean, an original understanding, the understanding that people had at the time would be public in the form of newspapers and historical records. Uh, maybe you can get framers' intent out of this, but the notion of framers' intent um, is problematic because it attributes some kind of group intention, and it's not clear what that even means. Um, evidentiary considerations. To determine the original understanding, the justices must, must look at all the historic historical evidence, including public records, uh, the debates, hearings, and even dictionaries. Even dictionaries um, count as evidence. All right. How you interpret a constitution makes all the difference. Morally speaking, as, you know, as well as um, prudentially speaking, by prudential, I mean this. A consideration is prudential to the extent that it appeals or implicates your self-interest. Right, so I have a prudential interest in eating um, vegetables because it's good for my health and it satisfies my hunger. Moral interests are different kinds of interests. 
All right, now, what constitutional, uh, what principle of constitutional interpretation um, is chosen makes a world of difference, both morally and prudentially. It makes a difference with respect to what your freedoms are, what you can do. This is big deal stuff. Let's start with the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment says, of the United States Constitution, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, now let's just look at the language here. Language here says something really interesting about the point of the right to bear arms. It says a well-regulated militia, that's kind of like an army, being necessary to the security of a free state, right? A militia being necessary to protect um, the state from uh, invaders or I don't know, oops, whatever else there is to protect the state from, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, the original point of the Second Amendment was it's not an individual right to bear arms for self-defense and sport. I guess if hunting, if you think killing defenseless animals is sport, um, that was the point of the Second Amendment. It wasn't to you know, provide an individual right to self-defense or give you a right to hunt, to shoot down animals. And the courts, um, the Supreme Court had considered challenges to the Second Amendment um, in the form of gun control regulations for a hundred and some odd years. And until 2008, they always went with the obvious language. Look, it doesn't define an individual right to bear arms. It's all, you have a right to bear arms in connection with a militia. And that means that the right can be restricted so as to achieve, as long as it's narrowly tailored, not to impair achieving the position of defending the free state. That means stuff like handguns can be prohibited, or AK-47s, or AR-15s, which is the gun of choice among school shooters in the US, which has become our national pastime. In 2008, D.C. versus Heller, and this makes me so irritated. The most prominent originalist in, in the history of American jurisprudence is Antonin Scalia. And look, you know, you might disagree with me. You, you might agree with his views. That, that's, that's fine. But I'm standing up here, and I get to express my views. Um, and you know, you're, you're welcome to challenge them. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything like this. But this, this bothers me a lot. Antonin Scalia claimed to be an originalist, and then he wrote the majority opinion that pretty much resulted in a, a right to, an individual right to bear arms that can't constitutionally be restricted. And there's, ah, forgive me, but there is no way you get that out of an originalist reading. I don't know, morally speaking, right? I mean, I'm not in a position to say objectively. I don't have any privileged access to the truths of objective morality, if such there be. But this I know, I can read, and there is no damn way that you get the kind of right to bear arms that Scalia justified from the text of this. If you are going to be a consistent originalist or a consistent textualist, you're not going to get that result. Scalia got that result. But you can see, right, already the difference a theory of constitutional interpretation makes the difference that an original theory would make. Strictly speaking, although Scalia justified this holding on originalist grounds, it can't be justified on originalist grounds. Um, he reached the result that he wanted to. Now, you might be able to, uh, to justify this on the strength of a different principle of constitutional interpretation. Maybe you can. But I, I'm just objecting to the fact that he was an originalist who didn't who, who didn't justify this, this very profound decision that had tremendous, that has had tremendous effects on the, the, the social landscape in the United States. Um, he, didn't, he didn't deploy his own theory to get this. He just sought out the best results, which, to tell you the truth, is also a principle of interpretation. Extract the content you want from the symbols you want. That's a principle of interpretation, and it is principle. It's just a bad principle. Can, 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 can I ask? I, I think you take, probably... Take, take back this line. Uh, what if actually we have two things uh, within this uh, 
a mandate, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, that's one, shall not be infringed. Hmm? Is it possible to read it that way? Um, a well-regulated, okay, well, I mean, it's just as, as a matter of English. Would not be correct. Um, yes, because the word infringed applies to rights. There are two things you can yeah. do with respect to rights, and this, this is, now this is actually... But this is, this is really framed in... Uh, no, no, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not a native speaker, but it sounds very weird, even in, even in plain English. Uh, like well-regulated militia being necessary this year. The right of the people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed. Right. It's but, okay, the, the, the kind of thing that can be infringed is a, a right, um, not a well right. You can't infringe a militia. There's certain things you can't infringe. You can't infringe a car, you can't infringe me, you can't infringe a militia. We're just not the kinds of things, conceptually speaking, that can be infringed. Rights can be infringed or they can be violated. Um, the interesting thing about the word infringed is, um, maybe this makes some sense. To, to, infr and it, to, to say that a right has been infringed is not necessarily to say that it's been violated. To say that it's been violated is to say that it's been infringed in a morally unjustifiable way. Infringed is sort of agnostic with respect to whether or not the encroachment upon a right is, um, is morally justified. Uh, I don't know why I thought that interesting, but I, I don't know why I think anything that I think is interesting is interesting. Uh, but look, this much, you have to you have to give me. I mean, you're trying to rescue um, Scalia, the, the majority opinion, and the question is, look, I don't see how to do that without throwing out this first clause. The only thing that I can sense that I can make of this first clause, nobody's going to say this unless this first clause is intended to restrict the scope of the right articulated in the second clause. I mean, I, I don't know how to make sense of that. This just seems so obvious to me. But, you know, my sense of obviousness is not um, always um, infallible. I'm not, it's not infallible. Uh, Same-sex marriage and Obergefell. Oh, I forgot who, what the, who the other party was. I don't suppose it matters. Um, Obergefell, the Obergefell case did something really remarkable. Um, you know, <laughs> The way that it works, the, there's a federal system in the United States. You have a federal government, and they have um, they have certain powers that are in, uh, um, uh, is it an enumerated. They have to be specified, and then what the states don't have, what the federal government doesn't have, is left to the states. There were a lot of states, including the state in which I live, Washington, that, that legalized uh, same-sex marriage. You, and I, I emphasize the word marriage because we're not just talking about civil unions, we're talking about marriage. Um, there have been a number of states that have legalized same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court, and this, I didn't honestly think this, I would see this in my lifetime. Um, they uh, held that a, a restriction on same-sex marriage violated the Equal Protection Clause, which entitles everyone to the equal protection of the law. Um, but, okay, so, but the holding there couldn't be justified on originalist grounds. Why? Because the, the Equal Protection Clause was ratified in 1868, and at the time, homosexual activity was criminalized in 32 of the 37 states. And the historical point of marriage, the legal, the legal point of marriage, right, there's sacramental marriage, which is defined by the church, and it's up to the church, and then there's legal marriage. I, for, I'm not sure why we call them the same things. I think it's complicated thinking about this issue um, quite a lot. But um, the point of legal marriage was to legitimize sexual activity. Sexual activity has always been kind of frowned on by the law, right? Fornication was a crime. Adult, uh, so the law is always trying to get their get its business into your private sexual behavior, and the equal protection clause, right? Essentially, I mean, the, what the equal protection? Uh, to, excuse me. To the extent that homosexual sexual activity, same-sex sexual activity, was criminalized in 32 of the 37 states, well, it could be legitimate, right? So, what this? What the legal effect of, of uh, legalizing same-sex marriage is, is to legitimize same-sex sexual activities in the eyes of the state. 
not necessarily in the eyes of the church, right? Sacramental marriage and legal civil marriage are two different things. But in any event, you see the difference originalism makes. If they had applied an originalist theory of interpretation to same-sex marriage, there's no way, there's no way that they could have gotten the result that they got. It makes all the difference in reaching uh, an outcome, what your principle of interpretation is, what principle you hold for extracting content, propositional content, from strings of linguistic symbols, or words, or sentences, text. Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson was decided in 1896. And the issue in Plessy v. Ferguson were state laws that required black students to go to different schools from white students. And the claim was, the claim was that those laws violated equal protection because it treated black folk and white folk differently. Well, the court held um, and, you know, at the time Plessy was decided, most states had laws either allowing or requiring racial segregation. So on an originalist, on an originalist uh, theory of interpretation, that's a slam dunk. It's okay. We can, you know, our founding fathers were racist, so we can enact any kind of racist law we want on the originalist principle. And essentially, you know, nobody talked in terms of originalism and framers and Tim and all of that stuff until comparatively recently. Right? When, when people became interested in theories of constitutional interpretation, they just decided stuff. I mean, I'm not saying they decided it on unprincipled ground, but they didn't think in terms of articulating some kind of general constitutional principle for interpreting the text. Um, the court held no problem with equal protection clause. Why? Because we're just separating them. Separate is equal. Which turned out to be nonsense because the schools that black kids went for any, they were separate, but they damn sure weren't even close to equal. The facilities were worse. They got less funding because of the, the districts that black people were segregated into the poorest neighborhoods um, where people didn't have the kinds of jobs to pay the kind of taxes to fund decent schools. Difference originalism makes. It was overturned, and we'll see how, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Ah, mmm, mmm, mmm. Right to reproductive privacy, the right to sexual privacy. I'm kind of in favor of that. No, don't ask me why. Griswold v. Connecticut. Connecticut had a law prohibiting, prohibiting, prohibiting the use of contraceptives. Connecticut enacted a criminal statute prohibiting, quote, any person from using any drug, any drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of preventing contraception. Okay, oh, you know what, I don't even, I don't remember the, the year. This was in the 50s, I think. No, no, 62. 1962 or 1963. So, you weren't allowed, I mean, they, Pharmacies couldn't sell these things, you know? They couldn't sell these things legally, and you couldn't use them legally. The Supreme Court did something really interesting, really interesting, and the right thing on my view, for what it's worth. The Supreme Court declared the statute unconstitutional, and depending on who's talking, right? I mean, you know, as a liberal person, I would say inferring, a, a constitutional right, deriving a constitutional right from the text. And if you're, if you're against, um, if you think Griswold was illegitimately decided, you're going to say they invented a constitutional right. But here's what the court did, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. They, they deduced this right from something called a penumbras. Penumbras. They looked at penumbras are beautiful things, um, if you can figure out what they are. And even if you can't, they looked at four amendments, the First Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment. Now, none of these amendments say anything, say, any, say anything about contraceptives. The First Amendment doesn't say you can use contraceptives. You know, you have a right to reproductive privacy or sexual privacy. Third Amendment doesn't say that either. 
Fourth Amendment doesn't say it either. Fifth Amendment doesn't say anything like it. What do these amendments say? What the court said is, and I'll tell you what they said, because that's what I do. I tell you what they said. The court looked at the First Amendment. First Amendment protects free speech, forbids Congress from enacting any law that will abridge free speech. Oh, the court said, that's concerned with privacy. Of what, really? Thought, conscience. And this is a nice move, a really nice analytic move, if you like this kind of, kind of result. They looked at the third, oh, uh, freedom of worship, same thing. The right to religious freedom, privacy. Even the prohibition of an establishment of state religion, privacy. The third amendment prohibited the law from requiring citizens to uh, put soldiers up in their homes, quarter soldiers. Privacy. Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Privacy. Right? Cops can't just come up and pat me down. Right? I have a privacy interest in my person and my home. Fifth Amendment, the right against, to, uh, the right against compelled self-incrimination. Privacy. People don't have a right to coerce, coerce me to tell you things that might subject me to incarceration. So what the, what the court did was it inferred or invented the right to reproductive privacy. This, is about, this isn't a right to informational privacy. It's only about reproduction and sex. From the penumbras, the emanations of the amendments, not from what the, the amendments them said explicitly, but from the emanations. They added the spirit of the amendments. Look, there's a privacy thing here. They're concerned about privacy here and there. And that's how they, they got there. Now, the right to privacy started out Innocent enough. I mean, there may have been a, there may have been opposition to this. Um, I'm not, I, you know, I can't imagine that, that people were losing their minds over being able to, to buy contraceptives. I mean, don't you don't want a contraceptive? Don't buy a contraceptive. That just seems simple to me. I'm not going to say the same thing about abortion. I mean, there's a, there's a real, there's honestly a real issue there. People don't sometimes. Well, liberals, people like me, don't appreciate that there's a genuine issue there. And I'll be straight up about it. So the right to reproductive privacy starts with Griswold and then, then it culminates in the Roe v. Wade decision which legalized abortion pretty much without restriction during the first trimester. Um, during the second trimester, it allowed states, it, it legalized, it, it allowed states to restrict abortion only to protect the health of the mother and post viability the state could prohibit it entirely. And the reason for this is, well, the court did a lot of strange things, but here's the issue, right? You know, I said, if you don't want to buy, if you don't want a contraceptive, don't buy one. Um, you know, some liberals say, if you don't want an abortion, don't get one. You know, and that's, that, that overlooks what the real issue is. The real issue here is this. If you're pro-life, you think that the fetus from the moment of conception is a person, the same kind of thing I am with the same rights, and it has a right to life, such that terminating a pregnancy amounts to intentionally killing an innocent person. That's the view. The court actually, the court glossed over that issue. Um, they, they, um, they punted on that in a way that honestly struck me as illegitimate, and still does. I mean, I think if you're a pro-life, you have every right to be pissed about Roe v. Wade because they punted on the most important issue. And the issue was whether it should be considered from the standpoint of morality or from the standpoint, from the standpoint of the Constitution, murder. People who are pro-life claim that abortion is murder. And you've got to deal with that issue. If you're pro-choice or um, pro-abortion rights, you have to deal with that issue. Okay, the curious case of Robert Gore. This was kind of a fun story in uh, U.S. jurisprudence. Robert Bork was, uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, I can't remember when, 90s, I guess. And Bork was an originalist. And in, or when, you know, when, in order to, to, be, to, to get yourself on the Supreme Court, your appointment, your nomination has to be confirmed by the Senate. And there are hearings, and they're on TV. 
And Bork was a hardline originalist, and I'm going to give him credit for this. He was straight up about his commitments. But it sank his, uh, it sank his nomination because he had to say that Griswold v. Connecticut, right, the, the decision that afforded the right to reproductive privacy that allowed, that guarantees that you can use contraceptives in the privacy, in, in the privacy of your home. Um, and Brown v. Board of Education, which we'll talk about shortly, which overturned Plessy v. Ferguson and held that public school race-based segregation was unconstitutional, he had to get up in front of a million Americans on TV, on TV, and say, nope, that's the way those cases should be decided. And that was the end of his, that was the end of his, uh, his career on the court. He was not confirmed. Nowadays, judges don't answer those questions. Or, or nominees don't answer those questions, which you know may or may not be the right strategy. All right, so why would anybody think, and I put it this way because I don't think that originalism is a, is a justifiable choice, but you know other people might and they do. Why would anybody think this? First argument is judges can't make legitimately make law. They can't, they can never, it's, they're never morali morally justified in making law, ever. The role of judges is to apply the law and make it. Okay, so on this view, any judicial lawmaking is illegitimate. Anybody want to react to this? Is that what judges are doing in the system? They create law that's based on precedents, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, they mess this, there's, there's no way to avoid. I mean, I, yes, I think that's right. Uh, there's no way for judges to avoid making law. Um, I and mean, they do it. If they, if they overturn a precedent, if they overturn um, a holding, they've made new law. If they fill the gap, if they fill gaps, sometimes laws have gaps in them. And judges, their holdings have the effect of filling in some content where there's content missing. Now, you can say, I, I suppose you could say, you could set up a system so that judges can never over, overturn precedent. They can never change the law, and they can. And if the law isn't clear, if the law isn't clear, they have to they have to dismiss the case or decline jurisdiction. But the problem here would be the legal system would be extremely inefficient because then you're leaving all the major problems to the legislature to try to solve. And it's hard to be a legislator. It's very hard to make law if you're a legislator. Because you've got to craft these general rules. The judges have an advantage, in, in, in a sense. I mean, the judging strikes me as a really hard job. I'd rather be a legislator than a judge any time because, you know, I don't feel I'm um, qualified. I, I don't know that I can sit and look somebody in the eye and say, you know, I, 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 you can't do this. It's just I don't feel comfortable, um, comfortable with that. That's, you know, some people are, some people are not. I, I can't do it. I don't want to be a legislator either, but I'd rather be a legislator because, you know, I, I, all I do is, as a legislator, you just float general principles out there, and you're not pointing a gun at anybody. That's what, that's what um, judges do, right? They, they utilize, they deploy the coercive mechanisms of the state in order to tell you what to do in a particular instance. But a legislator, the problem is a legislator can float this general principle. There are only so many possible cases that can occur to a legislator. This is why the... Um, judicial decision making is the best way to handle conflicts because they're in a position they get all the facts, right? The facts are presented for them. They don't have to anticipate this the way legislators do. When they're making statutes, they have to anticipate all the things that go, can go wrong. A judge gets the facts about something that has gone wrong and can make a decision on that basis. Um, so, yeah, you could probably craft a system in which judges don't have the authority to make new law, but it would, your, your legal system would be compromised greatly in terms of its efficiency in regulating behavior. Um, thank you, very, very nicely done. Uh, judges must follow the meaning of the law. And look, let me say something. I, I don't, I, I'm not an originalist and I disagree with originalists, but I, let me be real clear about what I am and what, what, we're, what we are and, not, and are not accomplishing when we evaluate these arguments, right? To say that this argument doesn't work, to criticize it is to say merely that the argument doesn't work. It's not to say that the, that the position is, is false. To say that an argument isn't a good argument is not to say that its conclusion is false. 
In order to show that a conclusion is false, you've got to, you've got to make an argument, provide evidence for thinking that it's false. Just, just uh, showing that an argument is flawed does not falsify the conclusion of an argument. The legitimate role of judges. Oh, that's, sorry, that's the one we did. Judges must follow the meaning of the law. Um, here's how it goes, in essence. Judges must interpret the Constitution in accordance with the meaning of the text. Okay? Claim one, judges must interpret the Constitution in accordance with the meaning of the text. I mean, that sounds pretty reasonable. Interpretation is all about meaning. So, you know, that's what it's supposed to, that's conceptually what it's supposed to do, I guess. So, judges ought to do that. What's the meaning of the constitutional text? The meaning of the constitutional text, constitutional text is the original understanding. Therefore, judges must interpret the Constitution in accordance with the original understanding. Big problem, but it's subtle. Anybody want to take a shot at it, Alex? No? Okay, sorry. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. Anybody? Well, it's presupposing the very thing it's trying to prove. It's one way of putting it is circular reasoning, but strictly speaking, it's begging the question. To beg the question in an argument is to presuppose the very thing that you're trying to show. Let me give you an example. See, reasoning is, reason, take as many courses in reasoning as you can. There should be courses in logic. Generally in life, other things being equal, other thing, and other things are not always equal. The person with the best reasons win. So the more you know about reasoning, the better off you will be in life. Um, I mean, it doesn't guarantee, being able to reason well doesn't guarantee that you're gonna, you're, everything's going to go well. I reason pretty well, and sometimes things don't go so well for me. Um, but, okay, here's the problem, right? It's assuming the very thing that's proving. I'll give you an example of how, it's, how this is done. You know, I find the question, I mean, I've done a lot of work in philosophy and religion, I've thought a lot about God, the existence of God. I've always been, well, except for a period in my life, I've always been an agnostic who wanted to believe that God existed, who wanted to believe that, because that just seems like, you know, without God, ah, the story just seems to be meaningless, you know, and I want meaning in my life, I want you know, the, the, the things, the, the difficulties that I've gone through to have some kind of meaning. To, I want my suffering redeemed. And the beautiful thing about the God narrative is that it accomplishes both those things. But I just, I couldn't believe. I, 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 it's not that I was choosing not to. It's that, you know, I look around in the world and, man, there's a lot of awful stuff going on. You know, some of it people do, but some of it people don't do. Some of it's just the way the world is set up. Cancer is not something anybody does to someone else. Aging is not something that anyone does and something someone does to someone else. This is horrible stuff. My mama is um, 90 years old. She's got um, congestive heart failure, level three or four, emphysema. You know, she's hooked up to an oxygen tank 24 seven. She's got a benign brain tumor that's growing and colon cancer. And I've been watching her deteriorate over the years. You know, sometimes she'll be sitting in a chair and she just, when she thinks nobody's looking, she'll cry. And I, I feel it, man. I feel it. I, it just horrifies me that my mom's going through this and it horrifies me that I might go through this. This is the way the world is constructed. And I think to myself, man, you know what? A morally perfect, perfect loving God would never set up the way the world that way. I wouldn't set up the world that way. I wouldn't do it. And I'm, I'm a jerk. I'm a jerk, but I wouldn't do that to anybody. Even a, even a critter. You know what a critter is? It's an animal. Animals get cancer. How messed up is that? So I remember I was a, I was a student at university, and you know there are always people at university on the campuses they are proselytizing. They want to bring you to Jesus. And I always, I always listened to them. I always did, because I wanted to believe. I wanted that narrative. I wanted that happy ending story. I really wanted to believe that. And one day, somebody said to me, do you believe in God? I said, no. I said, why? I, 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 and then I said all this kind of stuff. He said, you know, 
you should believe in God. There's evidence that God exists. And I said, what is that evidence? You know, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to get this thing that I want really badly. And he says this. You know why you can believe that God exists? Because the Bible says God exists and the Bible is the word of God. Now, would that convince you? That's just reasoning in a circle. I want him to prove that God exists. And then he, t- he already gives me the evidence, the, a premise that assumes God that exists. His argument doesn't succeed in doing anything other than running around in a big circle. That's what this does. It's circular. This is the very thing that has to be proved on an original view. And it's, it, it's not the conclusion. It's in the reasons. It's in the premises. It's circular reasoning. It begs the question. It is really warm in here. Have y'all noticed that? Huh? Oh, and the music is gone, too. Well, that's good. Now, this is an argument. Okay. I mean, this is an argument against originalism. And truth be told, I really think, I mean, I think this is the best argument against originalism. The question is, okay, if you're an originalist, you think that the understandings that people have how many? Oh, 229 years ago. I think I have to adjust that. The uh, Constitution was written um, in 1787, and this is 2018, so that would be 231 years ago and not 229 years ago. And my question is this. Look, don't get me wrong. White men are cool with me. I, I'm not against white men. But old white men, you know. Some of my best friends are old white men. Me a driver, for example. Love him. But he's not, let's face it, he's no white man. Um, why in the world would we think that what? And 231 years ago, them old white men were racist, sexist. And here comes my liberal, liberalism coming out, homophobic, transphobic. They were just angry about everything. They wanted to discriminate against everybody except white men. Why should we think that their opinions morally bind us 231 years later. I'll tell you what, things ain't perfect in the United States. Far from it. As far as I'm concerned, things are as bad in the United States as they have, I can ever, uh, probably since the 60s. It is not a good time to live in the United States. Other things being equal, right? I mean, very blessed to live in an economically, in a a nation that's as economically uh, strong, as the United States, but other things being equal, as far as I'm concerned as a liberal, I'm not happy about what's going on in America. But what people thought was okay 231 years ago is not okay. It's not okay as far as the vast majority of people living in the United States, even people who disagree adamantly with with most of my political views are gonna say racism and sexism is not cool. It's not cool, so why should these guys bind us with what they thought. Actually, it's not the people who wrote it. It, it, the original understanding, excuse me, what people understood this stuff to mean. Why should the views of a bunch of folks who lived in a much less complicated world, who couldn't possibly anticipate what this world would look like, who were racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, why should what they thought bind us as a nation now? I don't know. Now, there's a response to that. Anybody want to respond to that? Defend originalism? Yeah. Are you, okay. What if an originalist said, uh, like, uh, we should amend the Constitution? Oh, no, that, that's cool. I, I, I remember you, right? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, we talked yesterday. Yes. Yeah, good to see you. Well, uh, um, an originalist can say that. Sure, that's true, but here's the problem, I guess, for, for me. Amending the Constitution, and that's a good argument. Amending the Constitution is a really difficult thing to do. I mean, it's... In, the, in 1975, there was a proposed amendment, I think it's 75, mid 70s, the Equal Rights Amendment, which just said something like this, the law can't discriminate against women. And you couldn't get that passed. Um, so yeah, one way you can change the, con- the, the content of the Constitution, and if you're an originalist, this is a fair move. This is, this is a really good move. It's, it's the best one as far as I can see that's available to the originalist. One way to do that, is to say, look, you know, yeah, um, 
Originalism can sometimes result in very bad outcomes. And a lot of originalists will, and you know, it's a shame that I don't think Morris made the argument that you made. He might have been able to rescue his candidacy, his nomination. Just amend the Constitution. Yeah, that's fair enough, and I think that's most of what most originalists would make that move. Again, you know, but the underlying presupposition is still, I don't understand why we're bound by the original understanding to begin with. Yeah, that's, that's a way of fixing bad originalist results, but it doesn't address the, the, the concern that I articulated, um, namely that there's no reason to think we should be bound by what these people thought 231 years ago. You know? um, but that, it seems to me that that's the best move. Ah, uh, the moral reading. You know what? As much as I love this, I'm a moral reading guy. The difficulties that afflict this theory are as bad as the difficulties that afflict um, originalism, which is the beauty of theory. No free lunch when it comes to theory. Your theory is always, you always gonna have to pay something for your theory. It's like you have to pay something for your lunch. I don't know how that works. Okay, here's how it goes. This was articulated by a guy, um, by Ronald Dworkin, um, one of the most famous, I mean, I, my, my thing is legal theory, um, legal philosophy. Um, I, I don't mess with this stuff that much. Ronald Dworkin was one of the, the, is one of the three most famous legal theorists in, in history. He pointed out that if you look at the constitutional language, um, and again, we're talking about the United States Constitution, you will see lots of a language that's morally loaded. For example, the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, unreasonable is a moral term. Unreasonable doesn't mean the same thing as irrational. Somebody's behaving irrationally if they're behaving in a, a manner that's, um, I don't quite know how to put this, irrational. Irra if you're behaving irrationally, chances are you have a medical problem. You may have a medical problem. You have, may have some kind of mental illness. Unreasonable is, is different, right? If somebody said, you know, if, if, if a friend of mine hurts, you know, demands something that's unfair to me, I don't say that's irrational. I'll say, hey, that's unreasonable. That's unreasonable. Um, I won't say it's irrational, although in some cases it might very well be. Unreasonable connotes unfair. It has a moral connotation. And Dworkin thought, look, the right way to read these constitutional guarantees is to read them as if they're incorporating moral requirements, as if the concern of the framers was to um, articulate, um, to codify, essentially, the requirements of morality. A, right to, a constitutional right to free speech is supposed to track a moral right to free speech. It seems reasonable to think that governments don't get to try to legislate my thoughts or legislate my speech. That's morally wrong. And so the idea here is that there's, there's this morality, there are these truths of morality, and the Constitution is, is trying to reproduce these, these moral guarantees as they pertain to the freedom of speech, the freedom of religious worship, um, the, uh, the right to be free of, of unfair seizures, and so on. Uh, yeah, searches and seizures. So the idea here is that the text of the Constitution should be interpreted to reflect the content of an objective morality. Now, here's the difference that the moral reading approach can make. Brown v. Board of Education, considered one of the highlights of American jurisprudence. Brown v. Board of Education overruled Plessy v. Ferguson, which, as we saw, um, uh, allowed for race-based segregation in public schools. So Brown v. Board of Education, uh, uh, the court argued that, that separate, right, plus he held separate, is, separate but equal doesn't violate the Equal Protection Clause. The Brown court said, uh-uh, separate is inherently unequal, and they overturned the Plessy case. And again, they made law, right? When you overturn a case, when you reverse a line of, of precedent, you have made new law. And hence, that public school segregation on the basis of race violated equal protection laws. How did they get there? 
Well, you know, I, when I said, um, when I was talking about Plessy, I'm sure I had, a, had um, a discernible emotional reaction to separate but equal. Um, it's not just, I, I said something about, well, it's separate but equal. They were separate, but the facilities weren't equal. It's even worse than that. To separate two races is to say something about the comparative merit merits of the two races. White folks uh, were the dominant race. Uh, the, I, they're going to be a, weird. I guess I'm white too. We're going to be a minority at some point. Um, but in the case of, you know, we're the predominant majority at the time Plessy was decided. And the whole point of segregating black people from white people was people didn't want for their white kids, because white people were making all the law, to mix with black kids. This made a statement about the comparative moral worth of the two races. And my reaction is this is morally appalling. This, in essence, what the Brown Court did was essentially read into the Equal Protection Clause. They rejected an originalist view. They read into the Equal Protection Clause the objective requirements of morality, which I think most, of, uh, all of us should agree, um, prohibits race-based segregation in public schools, you know, say, maybe private schools are a different issue, I don't know, but in public schools where it's funded by tax money, no. In any event, Brown v. Board of Education was really interesting because, ooh, boy, it was ahead of its time, 1954, before civil, the Civil Rights Movement. In 1970, the, the Supreme Court, stood, the South went, Crazy. They went crazy. They went nuts. They were not happy with this. White people did not want their kids, and maybe their kids did not want to go to school with black kids. And so the South went nuts. So nuts did the South go that the Supreme Court waited 18 years, 18 years, to enforce Brown v. Board of Education by ordering courts to de uh, uh, schools, to public schools to desegregate. I was living in North Carolina in 1972. I started high school in 1972. I went to a, a high school, um, Terry Sanford Senior High School. Um, the year before I went, it was like 97% white. The year I went, it was like 40% white. Um, and people in that region weren't happy about that. Um, school busing really caused a great deal of disruption in the South. Arguments for the moral reading. Why would anybody think that judges should try to read the requirements of morality into uh, the Constitution? Dworkin makes this ingenious. I mean, this is, this is pretty. This is really pretty. Um, he takes something like originalism and turns it on its head. This is the beauty of, I mean, this is the beauty of reasoning. When you put together something like this, this is gorgeous. This is simply gorgeous. Whether it works or not, it's gorgeous. It really is. What Dworkin said is, let's talk about framers' intent. Let's talk about what they would have intended, what they would have wanted, how they would have wanted judges to interpret the Constitution. The framers had some moral views. They had some moral views. Um, and they were written into the Constitution to permit slavery, um, to count black people as less, less than white people. They had some moral views. Here's the question. Dworkin said, Let, let's assume for the sake of argument that framers are de were decent, morally decent human beings. Would they want this to be the case? If I'm, if I'm a framer and I'm a morally decent guy, and look, I have lots of moral views, would I want my views imposed on the rest of society if they turned out to be mistaken? Morgan thinks a decent framer would say, no, if my views are mistaken, then they shouldn't be imposed on the rest of, on the rest of society. They shouldn't, the court should not impose them on the entire legal system. So the idea here is that if you look at the framers' intent, they would not want you to interpret the constitutional provisions to reflect what they believed at the time. They would want you to, about the moral issues, they would want you to interpret the Constitution to reflect the right moral values. Pretty, isn't it? Y'all see this? No? No? no. It's really just, you have to, maybe you have to squint. Sometimes you have to squint to see pretty. Um, it's beautiful. 
sadly, there's a problem. There's a problem. Actually, anybody want to take a stab at it? No? Well, here's a problem. And you can get, take a step like make a counter argument. Huh? I don't know, maybe they didn't uh, understand oh. you. Take a step like what would you say to be the pro problem with this kind of approach? Or the, the so reasoning. Not, the not, system, not the approach, but the reasoning. Yeah, the I mean, reasoning. The approach in reasoning. That, that was, uh, Here's the problem. Nobody's got, uh, nobody's got privileged access to the truths of objective morality. Nobody's got a, a, a direct line to the moral truth. Not me, not Dworkin, not the judges, nobody. So here's the problem, right? Look, you know, all of this is, is very nice. Um, you know, talking in terms of trying to read moral requirements into the Constitution, but nobody, has, nobody is infallible with respect to what morality requires with respect to the Constitution. The best all any of us and all of us can do is give our opinion, give an opinion about what morality requires. None of us are, are none of us can, are such that we're guaranteed to be right. So the problem with the moral reading, on, um, according to critics, is this. Supreme Court justices are appointed to the bench for a lifetime, for a lifetime. If everybody's views about morality are merely subjective opinions, what we're essentially doing is allowing judges who are utterly unaccountable to the, to the population, to, to citizen, the citizenry, to impose their subjective opinions on the rest of us for the rest of their lives, and that is undemocratic. That's bad. Undemocratic is bad. I read that. Oh, wait, yeah, that's, there it is, that's done. All right, living tree approaches. Remember, a living tree approach allows that the content of the Constitution can change and should change to reflect the evolving views of, of an informed population. And, it, it, you know, as a general matter, that sounds really nice because, you know, I think I, I said earlier, say what you will about, you know, I mean, like I said, I think that what's going on in the United States is not a happy thing right now. Um, country's in bad shape, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather live, I'd rather live in the United States now. I mean, the politics, let's forget the economic stuff, you know? I mean, obviously it's better to live in the United States economically now than it was 200 years ago or whatever. Um, but just politically, you know, slavery, no legalized discrimination, people, you know, generally believe that everybody should be treated equally. We are so enlightened compared to what we what we were um, at the time. The, what people were at the time the United States was, uh, um, I don't know, born, hatched, um, implemented. Then I, li I listen to this: the living tree approach, right? Evolving content, and the content evolves in accordance with the changing views of an enlightened society. It looks like it's going to be we're going to get the right kinds of ideas. Right? This isn't about discerning the requirements of a mind-independent morality. Right? Nobody has to have privileged access because what people generally think is stuff we can figure out. Right? We can just take a poll. Hey, people, do you think this is right? You know, Push Y if you think yes, push N if you think no. We can figure out what the, what the views of the people are. We can't necessarily figure out what the, what the truth is from a God's eye perspective because we don't have a God's eye to guide us. So this sounds really good. It also sounds kind of democratic because it seems to appeal to the consent of the people, right? One of the most important um, ideas justifying the coercive authority of the state to tell you what to do and back it up with a threat of force is that you consent to this, you agree. All right, if I agree to let you tell me what to do behind the threat of force, then I don't have any moral complaints. I've consented. Consent is magic. Consent is magic. By cons my consenting to something um, you do can turn your act into from something that's morally wrong and possibly illegal into something that's okay. If you come into my house without my consent, that's breaking and entry, and I assure you that the cops will be called. The cops will be called. 
On the other hand, if I consent, look at that, that's magic. Then, hey, there's no moral problem. You come in without my consent, and you've done something morally wrong. If I let you in, you come in, hey, it's all good. It's all, everything is good. So consent is magic, and consent is one of the most promising ways. Consent theories of legitimacy is one of the most promising ways to solve the problem of moral legitimacy, you know, which is, arises because the state seems to behave like a robber. Points a gun at you and says, hey, do as I say, or else. So this is beautiful, right? It, it, you know, when I think about it in the abstract, it looks beautiful because moral views seem to be evolving in the right direction, at least on my view, and I think on most people's view, well, I guess. Well, I, of course that makes sense, right? I mean, if we're the views, if ours are the views that are evolving, not, of course we're gonna think they're right, so we're all good with this. And this plays into consent. Theories of the, the idea that we're consenting to this, so it's A-O-K people to tell us what to do and back it up with a threat of force. Problem is, oh, oh well wait, see, and, and here's, how it, here's how it went with, with respect to Obergefell and same-sex marriage. 2001, Americans opposed same-sex marriage 57% to 35%, but by 2017, Americans were in favor of 62 to 32%. Now, I say here that we're talking about marriage, not domestic partnership. That's important. Because, you know, when, when you look at people who are against same-sex marriage, sometimes it's not, they're not against the idea that the state might recognize these unions. They don't want to call it marriage. Now, forgive me, I, I don't quite get what, you know, the attachment to the word marriage is concerned, but I, I, I you know, I, once again, I mean, I want to point out that civil marriage and sacramental marriage are different things. Sacramental marriage, the rules of sacramental marriage are set by the church and they reflect, you know, God's morality, or they purport to reflect God's morality. Civil marriage is just, man, it's just a legal contract. That's all it is. Two people get together. I got legally married, you know? Um, and we, what we did, we went down, we signed a contract, we took, made an oath. I have certain rights in, you know, with respect to property. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's legal. It's, Nothing romantic about legal marriage, you know? And there's no more, there's nothing any, it's, there's no more romantic than buying a car. You just put your name on a document and you drive off with a new partner, so to speak. Um, but in any event, right, even the numbers here, 62, 62 to 32%, don't reflect that percentage of the population that are opposed to marriage but are okay with recognizing civil unions or domestic partnerships. So, hey, People evolve. The views in America on same-sex evolve. For better, if you're in favor of same-sex marriage, for worse, if you're not. Okay, advantages. No one knows what true morality requires. Again, I, I said something about that. We can figure out what people, what people believe, but we can't figure out what true morality requires. I mean, we don't have infallible access to it. And again, evolutionism, or uh, the evolutionist approach, promotes the consent of the governed to be governed. Here's the big problem, and, and this is why I've started to worry a little bit. Um, you know, and again, this, these are just my liberal views. But it seems to me that one of the problems with Trump's administration and Trump's behavior, I mean, look, even if you agree with his politics, his behavior is scary. You know, he attacks the justice, his own Justice Department, his own FBI, his own investigative agencies, his own CIA, right? He attacks the courts. He's de in the process of delegitimizing de 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 the courts. These are undemocratic behaviors. These are the behaviors of an author someone with an authoritarian in inclination. That's scary to me. Now, what's that got to do with my faith in democracy? I mean, look, I, I think his, I'm, a, I'm a liberal. I think his policies are wrong headed, to say the least. Truth be told, I think he's as much motivated, he's motivated by two things appealing to his base to ensure he can't be impeached or incarcerated, and destroying Barack Obama's legacy. I don't see much of principle there beyond that. Um, but here's the concern, and that's just me. Forgive me if you're a Trump person, you know. I, I, um, Trump has a lot of fans in Serbia. I don't know whether it's because Serbians like Trump or they like the idea that, that, that Trump is running America. You know, because people, you know, most people, 
I unfriended on Facebook a lot of Serbians who I, my, I'm just I post anti-Trump all the time. Well, I shouldn't be saying that on the on the YouTube, you know, because they're going to come they're going to come after me. Um, and I know one one friend who was a friend. He wanted to see Trump. He wanted to see Trump elected for this reason. He wanted to see America shake, see him, see him shake up America. You know, so those people, I always ask those people who support, are so happy about Trump. You know, you're wrong, Ken, you're wrong. He's great, he's great, he's great. And then I ask the question, really? Would you want Trump running your country? And the answer, you, people go silent. They go silent real damn quick. They just wanted to see him tear up America. And believe me, I, I get it, man. I understand what happened here in the, uh, during the 90s. I can understand it. Y'all have had it in America. I understand. You know, I was here... Um, it was uh, when the bombings were, it was the 20th anniversary of the bombings, I think, a couple of years ago. Right, this is your history. Yeah, but it's not, not 20. It could be 10, 10 or 15 years, I don't know. It, 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 when, when, no, this was in the 90s, right? Yeah, and then, okay. So it can, cannot be 20. Okay, years. all right. It, was, yeah, it, must been, it must have been the 15th then, because it was 2014. And it's the 15th anniversary, and it's being um, commemorated by the population here. I stayed in my room all night. I did I, I, out of respect, you know, because I know how people feel about those NATO bombings, and I stayed. I stayed in my room out of respect. I get that people have a have you know good reason to be upset about America here. You know, and I don't know the right answer to these questions. Um, but I'll tell you this, I mean, so, you know, if you, if you were happy about Trump being elected because he was going to make folks like me miserable, I, you know what, I, I, I get that, that's okay. I, I can't fault you for that. But, this is, you know, I'm living there and it freaks me out every day, every day. I wake up at 5 in the morning, I check CNN, what has this guy done today, right? And then I'm stressed out the whole day, I can't sleep. And the reason that this calls into question for me, democracy, is because he got elected and everybody knew what he was. This is a guy who campaigned, and this is unprecedented in America. I, I know we're blessed. We don't, we don't, our presidential campaigns don't work like this until 2016. Lock her up, lock her up, lock her up, build a wall, Mexicans are rapists. This is how this cat got elected. I'm sure the police are going to arrest me when I get back to America. And this disturbs me because I used to have un, I used to have the deepest, most profound faith in democracy and the will of the people. And I'm scared now of the will of the people. I am. I don't know what the right answer is anymore. I don't know what the, how, it should, how it should go. There have been a number of books written in the last five years challenging democracy. Um, some people are arguing for an epistocracy governed, being governed by the wisest. You know, philosopher kings, which would be fine with me if you make me king. I don't want to be governed by any other because the rest of them are all wrong, uh, you know? Um, but I'm now afraid of this, the tyranny of the majority. And the problem with the evolutionist approach is this. It's essentially, you're essentially reading the, the views of the majority into the substantive protections of the Constitution, which were supposed to prevent the tyranny of the majority. The substantive, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth, Fifth, and whatever else, were ratified to protect against the tyranny of the majority. So that if the majority wanted to restrict speech or impose the state religion on you or, or um, search your stuff without justification, they couldn't do that. And so now to the idea that we're going to interpret the Constitution by reading the views of the majority into it seems to undermine the point of the entire Constitution to me. I mean, I don't know if that's right or not, but I'm just telling you how I feel. Because I like to share my feelings. We do that in America. If you watch daytime TV, you'll see this. Um, okay, uh, how much time do I got? No time. All right. I'm sorry. I'm not. Uh, did I go over? A little bit. Why didn't you shut me up, huh? Well, to to me, but you have the, the judge. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. We were ten minutes late. All right. Um, I'll just stop here. If you want to um, press me, if you ever want to contact me. Anybody have any questions or comments? Y'all want to jump on me for something I said? I'm a bad man. But maybe 
maybe it was really, uh, maybe, maybe it would be good to, to say something about the last slide, whether it's a kind of a matter of a choice or I mean, whether you can combine approaches. Uh, I think that it's, that this will, this will nicely enter into a perspective of, of a judge. Okay, all right, um, I'll, I'll do this quickly, Your Honor. Um, in practice, single theory or pluralist? You know, some people, some Supreme Court justices claim to be single theory guys. Scalia was a single, was a, claimed to be an originalist. Others are pragmatists in the sense that they'll, you know, pick and choose. Um, Sandra Day, Sandra Day O'Connor um, was a justice who, you know, uh, sometimes she went with an originalist or textualist approach. Sometimes she went with an evolutionist approach. Sometimes she might have gone with a moral reading approach. She just put different approaches together. And, you know, it is nice that I, um, that I can just close it out on this note. These pluralist approaches actually, um, you'll see more than one approach in the same decision. Roe v. Wade is a really remarkable decision because they used two different approaches to, to justify a right, a constitutional right to abortion. They use an originalist approach to define, to uh, understand the notion of a person, and then an evolutionist approach for reproductive privacy. Here's what they had to say about the, whether a person, okay, remember this, um, if you're a pro-life person, you oppose abortion on the, because you think that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception, and from the moment of conception, right, that has the moral rights to a moral right to life, and hence, from the moment of conception, abortion is murder, right? Because fetuses, if they're, if they're persons, they're innocent persons, and they're being killed despite being innocent, and that's murder. So the court had to mess. With, the court had to take this on. Oh, they tried, but they didn't really take it on. The issue isn't, I mean, they decided for the purposes of the Constitution whether the fetus is a person. They, they looked at that. But the real issue isn't the Constitution, it's about, it's a moral issue. Is the fetus morally equivalent to you and me such that it has a right to life that can't be infringed by, by abortion? But they punted on that. They punted on that. They, they considered it and refused to, they, 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 were, they were made aware of the issue and they refused to consider it because they said something really um, obnoxious. Feel that, you know, theologians haven't been able to figure it out, philosophers haven't been able to figure it out. So, you know, we're not going to worry about whether the fetus, from the standpoint of morality, is a person. We're just going to figure it out from the standpoint of the Constitution. And they said, quote, the Constitution does not define person in so many words. But in nearly all of these instances, the use of the word is such that it has application only postnatally, after birth. None indicates with any assurance, right? And um, none indicates with any assurance that it has possible prenatal uh, application. All this together with our observation that throughout the major portion of the 19th century, prevailing legal pro abortion practices were far freer than they are today persuades us that the word person as used in the 14th Amendment does not include the unborn. That's an originalist. That's an originalist. They took an originalist principle to get an unoriginalist result. You are not going to find an originalist who's okay with Roe v. Wade. That was a, a bit of magic that the court did. I mean, impressive in a way, but so it goes. As to the right of privacy, um, uh, what they did was they extended, remember this, the right of privacy, of reproductive privacy, this was just about, okay, this was about two, um, this gets complicated. I mean, the abortion issue is genuinely complicated. I'm a liberal and I'm in favor of abortion rights, but I'm not going to pretend that that's not a, a complicated, uh, that's not a complicated issue. I'm, it's not, it's not like, don't have an abortion if you don't want one, my body, my choice. No, no, there's, it, there's more to it than that. You have to deal with this concern that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception, and hence abortion is murder. So here's what they did. Um, they punted on that, on the moral issue. They said constitutionally it's not a person. And then what they did was extend, extend the right to reproductive privacy that was articulated in Griswold v. Connecticut to allow 
folks to use contraceptives, which is a nice thing, to, they extended it to the abortion decision. I mean, it makes sense once they found that the, the person, that the, the fetus wasn't a person for constitutional purposes, okay, they could, they could make this move, right? Right to reproductive privacy. It's just two people, right? It's just male, the man and the woman. There's no third person. Reproductive privacy is about what two people do in the privacy of their home with respect to reproductive decisions. Since the fetus is not a third person, you can extend the right to reproductive privacy to cover the fetus. It's beautiful in a way, right? I mean, it doesn't take on the issue honestly, on my view. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I do try to be honest about, um, I, I do try to be respectful of opposing views and honest about the problems in my own views. They punted on the issue that mattered. But apart from that, this is really beautiful stuff. It's a really beautifully crafted, coherent opinion that remains the most controversial opinion in the history of US jurisprudence. And they adopted this lovely pluralist approach where they employed the originalist theory of interpretation to uh, decide the issue of whether the fetus is a person from, from the, the standpoint of the Constitution, and then an evolutionist um, approach to extend the right of privacy to um, the right of privacy, an evolutionist and a moral reading approach to extend the right of privacy to cover the abortion decisions. Okay, now that really is the end. Can I ask one question? Of course. You can ask several. Well, you can ask. You can ask as many as you want. Okay. Uh, just concerning uh, the Second Amendment, since I'm almost totally unfamiliar with jurisprudential debates in America, uh, I was wondering uh, if uh, uh, security of a free state can be interpreted uh, so that uh, American government can jeopardize or violate the security of a free state. Yeah, you know, that's a, um, out of fairness, I, should, I probably should have considered that issue, you know, but I was trying to, I was trying to do a little bit of um, sneaky proselytizing. Yeah, that would be the argument, um, in effect, right, that look, the point, but if you like, check this, it's not going to get you every, uh, okay, uh, I'm saying you, I don't assume that you're kind of in favor of the right to bear arms. Are you? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. I'm right, just, you're just, we're just doing the, the theory, right? We're just, just playing the yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's the argument. That's the argument. Maybe that works. I mean, you know, it depends on how you interpret militia. I was sort of interpreting militia. Okay. Here's why I, I interpreted militia to be um, protecting the country, because I, we had a little revolutionary war before we became a country. We were just 13 colonies, and we were under British rule, and we got upset about that, taxation without representation or something like that. And we said, we, you know, we wrote out the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, and we sent it off to Britain, and Britain got pissed. Britain got pissed. They sent people with guns. Now, when we declared our independence, we weren't a country. We were, I mean, there wasn't any we, but, we say, but I, I say we. Britain sent a bunch of people, and we didn't have a country. We had an army, though. It wasn't an army because we weren't a country. It was a militia. So I interpreted the, 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 the idea of a militia, and this is only one way to do it. I mean, the, the other way to do it is, as you suggested, this is a really nice argument. I interpreted a militia as being like the Minutemen, right? Defending the territory, which would be the United States Armed Forces. Okay, but there's another way of looking at it. Because we were British colonies, right? We belonged to Britain at the time. And so Britain was kind of our government. And we felt we were being oppressed. And so we said, no, no, no. No more of this. No more of this. We're not going to take it anymore. And so, right, when you think of it this way, then the interpretation you suggested makes pretty good sense, right? Because we were fighting off government oppression. Britain was our government. We just happened to be a colony. We weren't part of Britain. <clears throat> Fair enough. Tell you what, that won't buy it. This is what it won't buy, though, I think. It's not going to get you handguns. 
It's presumably, I mean, you're not still out of that. You're not going to get this unrestricted freedom to buy any kind of weapon you want and operate it under any condition. It's, you're not going to get a right to go out and hunt animals from it. I mean, I, not that I want a right to hunt animals. I'm not a, hunt, I'm not a hunting guy, although I, 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 I do eat meat, so somebody's killing the animals for me. And, um, I'm just, you know, I just don't want to get that close to the killing business. I'm happy to eat them when they're killed, by, as long as they're killed by somebody else. Uh, but it won't get you a right to, uh, to, to bear arms for the purpose of hunting or for the purpose of individual self-defense. It will get you a right to bear arms in defense of, of um, in defense as a means of repelling the tyranny of government. And that would presumably involve far more restrictions than we can now get with respect to, to uh, guns. I'm, no, I'll be honest. If, if it worked to me, I'd take it. I take everybody's guns. You were up to me. But you know, ain't nobody gonna let me president. And that would never happen. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I, I, it would be a better society. If nobody ever had guns, look, there'd still be murder, but there wouldn't be as many. You know, there's something. This the beauty, so to speak, and I mean this in a twisted sort of way, the beauty of a, an AR-15 is you can kill at a distance. There's no intimacy involved, right? When you take the guns out of people, people's hands, they kill it gets intimate. You kill with knives in your hands, man. You can't, you know, they're, they're not they're not tiny little targets like something in a video game. You're covered in blood and guts. You know, and it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit harder to kill somebody when it's intimate like that, when it's um, than it is when it's from a distance. I've never killed anybody. But I'll tell you what, if I ever had to, or I thought I had to, I'd rather shoot somebody from 100 meters than, you know, kill somebody up close. I mean, even if the risk is the same, you know, somebody's tied to a chair or something, and I, it's just my job to kill them. So, you know, I get to come up with a knife and slice the throat. No, I don't. That's, that's too icky, man. That's too intimate for me. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather shoot from, from a distance where it doesn't even feel like I'm killing anybody. All the better if I can't see them, their brains blown to smithereens. You know, killing is a nasty business. So my view about this is you can't stop people from killing other people. You can't. We're just that, we're just that kind of thing. We get mad. We get really mad about stuff. And when we get really mad about stuff, we like to kill stuff. That's just what we do. Anybody in this room, including me, you can get somebody, you, any, there's no one in this room that you can't get mad enough to kill somebody. I don't know what your breaking point is, but I know you have a breaking point. You know, might be this. The only way you can save your child is to, to kill somebody. Or even worse than that, in case where somebody may not merit it, people get, one good way to get you killed, one good way to get yourself killed is to cheat on your partner. That's a really good way to get killed. I mean, if you're feeling that you, you know, you want to, you want to thrill, you're married or whatever, you're committed, and you want to put your life in danger. I mean, t trust me, you don't know your partner. You, you cheat your partner. Not that I know from experience. I have no idea. I have no idea. Trust me, men, you know this stuff, right? When you think about your partner cheating, do you get mad? Do you feel like whooping some behind? Do you feel like getting nothing? Come on, man. He's got everybody saying, like, no, no, we know we're real chill about that. She, she wants to cheat, she wants to cheat. See, I don't think I'd feel that way. I'd get, I would get very, very mad. In fact, oh, I can't I can't tell this story while the camera's running. Bill, I think you said enough. For YouTube purposes. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Let's go. I'm done. Thank you. I hope you had fun. really short, like five minutes break, and then we'll okay. have to move uh, onwards. <laughs> and to take some refreshments. <laughs>